Well, hello everyone. Thanks so very much for joining us. I'm Robert Urquhart, Head of Knowledge Outcomes and Research at Bernardo's Australia, and we're speaking to you from Ultimo in inner Sydney on the unceded lands of the Gadigal people. Now, if you drove just 10 minutes down the road from here, you'd be in front of the Sydney Opera House on Sydney Harbour and Gadigal land. And if you walk around the Opera House a bit further to the Sydney Harbour Bridge, you'd still be on Gadigal land. For more than 70,000 years, they've been living and working and raising their families, playing, hunting and fishing on this land. And I'd like to pause to thank the Gadigal for looking after this beautiful land I've been living, working and playing on for my whole life and to all the traditional owners of the many lands and nations on which we're meeting today. Ia ora, tenakata, 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 katoa, and a special shout out to all our colleagues joining us from Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'm so delighted you could be part of our webinar today. And good evening, and a very big shout out to our colleagues in the United Kingdom. I hope you're keeping warm and thanks for staying up to midnight. I was actually in England and Scotland in September visiting children's policy and practitioner colleagues and we'll be back in your way in August next year for my Churchill Fellowship. And I'm so pleased that you can join us here in the Southern Hemisphere. So if you're anything like me, you tend to rush to get ready for the webinar, right? And sometimes you don't have a minute to get prepared and settle in. So before we dive into it, Let's all take two minutes. As you can see, I've got my pen and I've got my notebook and I've got a cuppa as well. So, um, so you've got two whole minutes either to go to the bathroom, have a drag on a ciggy or make yourself a cup of tea. You can't do all three. So it's decision time, people. Two minutes. Well, we'd love to know which traditional land you're on, so drop that into our chat. Um, Alex, our advocacy manager, who's over there, will monitor the chat today, and there'll be time to answer questions at the end of our presentation. And when you have questions, you can pop them into the Q&A, which Alex will also monitor. And it's important to say that our session today will talk about the impact of domestic violence on children, and it's important to recognise that we will all respond to that information differently. So 
please take care of yourselves. So, okay, we're all now ready to roll. Well, there are just three things I want to talk about today. Firstly, why does this topic even matter? Secondly, what the research tells us about prevalent myths in the community. And thirdly, explore what we can do as practitioners and policy makers, makers to begin to make a difference about that starting today. But before we go there, why are you here on this webinar? What's the first thing that comes to mind? And write that down. And if you feel comfortable, you can drop your answer into the chat. Why are you here? And I'll give you a moment to write down your answer. Why are you here? Well, thanks so much for sharing and writing down what brought you here. And that's just so interesting to know. Well, more than 280, 180 people have registered for this webinar. So let's say it's 280 in round figures. Now we know from the research that 112 people in this meeting or two out of five people have been exposed to domestic violence in some way during their childhood. Now, one thing that research tells us is that every organization, big or small, has employees who have been harmed by domestic violence in childhood. And there's a powerful case for every organization to be responding to this. It also tells us, because we are all affected by this, that there's a potentially large coalition for change in the community. And we can start to bring that coalition together if we can debunk some of the common myths about children and domestic and family violence. Now, this webinar is part of the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. And you are all playing an important part in the 16 days by being here today, because you are investing your time in learning about the research findings and being part of national and international conversations about the lifelong impacts of domestic and family violence can have on children's lives. And six, since it's 16 days later on, I'll be asking you to write down your thoughts on the practical actions we can all take starting today to make a difference. Well, on the one hand, we have a growing awareness of domestic and family violence. The community is beginning to understand that our most vulnerable children have the right to be supported and live free from violence, and they want something to be done. And on the other hand, thanks to social media, we have a greater openness to talking about trauma and seeking professional support. And we can bring that increased community awareness of the prevalence of domestic and family violence together with a growing openness about talking about trauma and professional support by listening to victim survivors of childhood DFE about their experiences and how they wanted the community to support them. For example, at Bernardo's, I led a national research study of adult victim survivors of childhood of domestic and family violence. And uh, Bernardo's undertook this research so that we can raise awareness of the impact of domestic and family violence on children and really encourage our supporters and stakeholders to be part of a, a conversation about how we can prevent family violence. But what was really interesting to me is our participants, our, our survey respondents, really wanted to share their stories of how they were impacted by DV's children without fear and, or judgment. And they showed us that in that their stories poured out every time we asked an open-ended question in the National Online Survey, and we asked if there was anything else they would like to tell us. And so many of them said they were telling us as researchers because they want to change from their stories. For example, one of our participants told us, I needed to be believed. I needed someone to be willing to investigate without prejudice. I needed to be shown how to identify my feelings. I needed to be shown how to engage with my peers, make friends with safe people and keep those relationships. I needed to form proper attachment bonds. I needed counsellors who understood trauma and that my outward symptoms 
did not need an expensive pill, but were signs of a terrible story. I needed people who believed there were bad people in this world who walked around in plain clothes. Now, it's fascinating to consider our survey findings in the light of other statistics. And we can see how they reflect the really common disconnect that happens between the violence children experience and its enduring impact on them. Now, we know from other research that children who experience um, DV, when compared to children who have no known experience of violence, they experienced an average delay of six years between when police or health services became aware of DV in a household with children and children receiving a mental health service. And this lapse of time can lead to a real disconnect where children's behaviour becomes the problem rather than really symptomatic of their experience of violence. And um, it, it may be just like this in your services, but we see many children who've experienced violence coming through our family support services and other services with numerous sort of diagnoses, whether it's some um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD, or um, oppositional defiant disorder, or ODD, um, even autism spectrum disorder, or ASD. And by that point, so much of the focus of the service systems tends to be put on managing their emotions and behaviour, and often not enough thought is put into what they have experienced. Now, we also know that children who experience DV, when compared to children who have no known experience of violence, are also five times more likely to receive a mental health service by the time they reach 18 years of age. Now, here's um, a brief two minute video. And in this excerpt, Teban shares her lived expertise um, as a victim survivor, who spoke at our launch of our report as a victim survivor, and is also a fierce advocate for children and mothers who've experienced domestic and family violence. And she talks about the delays in getting mental health support and counselling for her children. And I want to say, we know, we all know that children, as they feel and become safe, will begin to disclose their experiences. And Tegan's situation shows how we've become better at wrapping services around adult victim survivors, but we aren't always able to take that approach with children who have their own unique needs. Now, I know for some of you working in specialist services, you may have those services for children in house, which is fantastic. Whereas in many other settings, they're still very difficult to access. For example, for children in the family law court system. So um, let's see from Tegan. The truth is, the abuse never stopped. When I left the relationship, everyone put me in to see a psychologist. Everyone made referrals for me to be looked after. Now, in those sessions, I tried to source help for my children. And I was told that children are resilient. And yes, they are to an extent. Now, let's fast forward five years. My children have come out with things that I've had to seek out help for because they have experienced trauma and they haven't processed the trauma. So my eldest son has come out and made um, statements to me about things that the perpetrator did to him. And my now nine-year-old son has he's starting to articulate more of what he remembers and how he felt. So he was, I think he was about four or five at the time, but he remembers hiding under the bed and he remembers feeling scared. So he, now that he's articulated that, we can start to process that trauma. Uh, however, if he'd been in access, if he, if he had had access to a child therapist or a play therapist immediately after the trauma, I feel that he wouldn't need, be needing to be processing this now. We need more in place to help these kids because at the end of the day, they're our future. And if we're not targeting the issues at a young age, then we're going 
we're creating another problem later on. And we have a perfect opportunity right now to go in and create a better future for these kids. What um, Tegan put so powerfully is that there were services and support for her, but not for her children when they most needed it. Well, economic hardship is driving an increased demand for services, and the cost of living, the rental crisis, makes it even more difficult uh, for women and children to find safe accommodation. And they find themselves trapped by coercive control, which continues the cycle of violence. Yet, we have very few services for children still. The services that support children, uh, just for example, like our program at Auburn Children's Family Centre, they're rare. And those that we do have, they often have um, long waiting lists, a rigid criteria that excludes most children, or um, they aren't based on research and evidence. Now, every child is an individual and they all have different needs, which will change over time, like Deacon's children. And that is why we need holistic services that can wrap around children that are able to treat them as individuals with distinct needs. Now let's pause for a moment. We've all come here for different reasons and based on everything that we've talked about so far, what would you like to take away from our time together? What thing do you need to take from here to gain value from uh, the time you've invested in being here or getting up at midnight? tonight you know and write that down and if you feel comfortable sharing throw that into the chat what's the thing that you want to take away at the end of our time together and uh, write that down and pop it in the chat if you like it i'll give you a, a moment to do that Yeah, yeah. thank you. Look, um, I just want to say uh, thank you so much for um, sharing those very important things about you want to take away and, you know, those, um, you know, learning more as a practitioner about caring for children for DFE, fantastic lived experience. That's something I hope we'll be really talking about and sharing today in terms of the myths versus evidence and then staying up to date with the latest evidence. They're all fantastic things. We'll be sharing some resources that are hot off the press. Um, as in this month at the end of um, uh, uh, of this presentation. So thank you for that. And um, yeah, while we're able to get to some of that, uh, we have only got 45 minutes. So we may not get through all of it with the limited time we have today, but we will endeavor to get through as much of it as we can in our remaining time. But if there's something that's outstanding, please, we'll put, please email us after the webinar. We'll put, give you both Alex and my email addresses at the end. And if we see that that's a, a shared need, we can uh, we can reach out back to you, or if it's a shared need, we can always do another webinar. But why should we as a community listen to these stories? Great question. Here are six top reasons why this problem needs to be addressed. One, the scale of the problem is huge. It's been estimated there are over 1 million children in Australia who've been invested, impacted by domestic violence. Two out of five is a lot of kids being impacted. Two, it damages children's development, well-being, and educational outcomes and often with a lifelong impact as the victim survivors in our story, in our report told us. Thirdly, um, it has a staggering cost to the community. It's been estimated that the direct cost to the New South Wales economy of domestic and family violence is $3.3 billion during the period 2020 to 2025. Four, it also drives the intergenerational cycle of harm. In Melbourne, Australia, there's been a doubling of kids aged 13 years and under committing violent crime over the last decade. Police have previously recorded half of those offenders as child witnesses to family violence. Five, 
We have few programs to help children heal. Even fewer of those are based on research and evidence. Six, children are the future parents of the next generation of Australians. And by helping them heal, we can disrupt the cycle, the transmission of violent behaviours once and for all. Well, what community attitudes prevent this pernicious problem from being tackled and act to keep children silenced and the hidden victims of domestic violence? What's the wider context here? So let's take a moment using the research to remind ourselves of the prevalent myths about domestic violence in children that, that we address in the report that are out there and influence the context of our service delivery. I don't have time to talk about all of them today, but that you'll need to read the report. So let's talk myths and evidence. Myth number one, young children are not aware of domestic and family violence what is occurring in the home. The survivor stories in the report highlight the ways in which children's experience differ from those of adults who live with domestic and family violence. We know that levels of awareness and understanding of domestic and family violence among young children experiencing DFB is under research. The facts are that 44% of survey respondents were four years of age or younger when the domestic and family violence began. Children who live with domestic and family violence are not extensions of the parent victim, but victim survivors in their own right. Myth number two, children are resilient. Children who witness domestic and family violence in their home are not harmed. The facts are that children are direct victims of DFV. Domestic and family violence affects each child differently. Research evidence shows that many children, regardless of whether witnessing or observing or being exposed to DFV or having it directed towards them, can be seriously harmed by it or harmed in multiple ways. Survey respondents identified numerous serious impacts during their childhood and youth. Myth number three, children can overcome any negative effects they experience from domestic and family violence. Research evidence shows that domestic and family violence can have major impacts on children, some of which continue into adulthood. And when you read the report, you will see that many survey respondents experience lifelong psychological, physical and emotional impacts. Myth number four, coercive control can only occur between partners. The facts are that 79% of survey respondents experience psychological abuse. Now, only one of our respondents used the word coercive control, but their stories strikingly captured one of the main features of coercive control when it occurs between adult partners, the considerable difficulty involved for victims attempting to describe it and convince others of its presence. They described a number of types of coercive and controlling behaviours which were directed towards this as children. This included parents denying abuse is happening when children disclosed it to a third party, transferring responsibility of abusive behaviour to the child, isolating or cutting off the child, um, humiliating and shaming, putting them down, making them feel bad, uh, making the child think they were crazy and playing mind games, denying food and clothing, even medical care as punishment. And our respondents often talked about walking on eggshells or setting off the abuser. One of our respondents talked about learning how not to poke the bear. So one of the most common experiences was being threatened in some way or being blamed for whatever's going on or both. Now, help resources. Um, Jess Hill, uh, author and leading activist, uh, had sh shares a fantastic resource overnight from Banaras Island. It's been shared by some other people as well, which is a graphic co-created by separate children and young people who grew up being subjected to coercive control. And Alex will drop a screenshot of that into the chat but we'll see if we can source that for you from uh, Banaras Island colleagues, uh, if you'd like to share it with others. So myth number five, children can always leave or get help and support. The facts are 37% of our respondents did not seek help or support. Respondents described many obstacles they encountered when they considered leaving the abusive situation or accessing help and support. This included that they did not know where to go to help, believed it could make the abuse worse, didn't believe anything could be done, believed the abusive behaviour was normal. That was really common. As children were told not to talk about it, had nowhere to go if they left. Myth number six, the police or the school teacher or the nurse or the counsellor will help you. Now, the facts are that 63% of our respondents sought help from someone within their family and or someone outside of the family 
such as a teacher or health worker. Experiences varied, but responses were more negative than positive. Respondents indicated that adults in their everyday life failed to notice the signs of abuse and intervene. Respondents who were brave enough to report abuse said they were not believed, um, discredited or punished further. And many of our survey respondents reported that they gave up seeking help after, after a bad experience. What does that mean to However, the help and support they most wanted was someone to notice the signs of abuse and to intervene and mental health and support and counselling service to be available when they're experiencing domestic and family violence and afterwards. And these findings point to the importance of providing adequate and ongoing mental health supports to children experiencing domestic and family violence and its aftermath. And that's where there's a really significant gap because psychological distress was one of the largest impacts of abuse, which many led to a range of long-term mental uh, health issues. And our findings also highlight the need for education at all levels of the community. We all have a role to play. And this is because our respondents strongly expressed a need for better support all around them. So this points to the need for increased public education around recognising the signs of abuse and knowing how to safely intervene. So let's pause for a moment. We talked about some of the barriers to listening to children who've experienced DFE and supporting them, including prevalent myths and misunderstanding. So why is solving this problem important to you? And write that down. And if you feel comfortable to share, please feel free to also drop that into the chat. Why is solving this problem important to you? Well, thank you so much for telling us why solving this problem is important to you and also writing that down. Well, 16 days is all about activism and doing. It's about action. And we have four more days to go before it ends on Sunday. So here are some of the things you can start doing today. You can read the report to deepen your understanding and see what you can learn from the adult insights on the support they receive when impacted by childhood, domestic and family violence. And I've got to say, it's a great read and their voices really do shine through. So di diving deeper into the report can be part of enriching your understanding and being evidence informed in your practice for the 16 weeks. So Alex will put the link of the report in the chat and we'll also send you any links that I mention now uh, after the webinar. There's some fantastic other free resources you can also dive into to enhance your skills in the space. There's a brilliant free reflective practice tool from Professor Sue Hewitt-Bell and Professor Ruth Phillips at the University of Sydney, the Enhancing the Safety and Liberty of Women and Children Subject to Domestic and Family Violence by Increasing Perpetrator Accountability, Messages from the Practice. And it's based on the findings from a fabulous uh, pro action research project, Safer Communities, Safer Children, uh, that aims to increase webs of accountability around perpetrators. And I was fortunate enough to keynote at their symposium at Sydney University last year. And many of the practitioners come from the Sydney District Pregnancy Family Conferencing. And shout out to you if you're here today. And it's organised around practice wisdom insights on being really child focused and putting that at the centre of your practice while simultaneously increasing, increasing perpetrator accountability. And for us as an agency, we found you know, consistent feedback from the judiciary that the careful use of perpetrator mapping and perpetrator mapping tools has been really invaluable in providing compelling evidence that has helped them make decisions that keep children safe. So there's one resource. Another one, uh, Ruth and David Mandel have just dropped two fantastic episodes of their podcast, Partnered with the Survivor, which are right on this topic. One is um, ensuring the, vi the voice of the children the child is heard, which is about two weeks ago. Uh, um, it's absolutely full of gems. Uh, and Ruth, uh, one gem from Ruth is where she talk about, talks about um, how violence and coercion isn't a parenting strategy. And it's, it's a really wonderful exploration of how 
the Convention of the Rights of the Child and the Safe and Together model align. And we're talking also about um, having DV proficient organisations as an aspiration. They've also done a fantastic episode on that, what, what this means for every organisation, big or small. Um, uh, David also suggested um, a paper uh, that they've also released as well, uh, which we'll drop into the chat, which has got some of the supporting arguments um, from the podcast. And also he's made available to us um, uh, a webinar, at the Quick Take webinar on supporting the rights of the child in domestic violence cases. Be quick, because it's only available for the next 30 days. Well, what's one other impact we can have? One of the biggest impacts we can have as individuals is breaking the silence and increasing awareness. And you can share on social media that you've come to this webinar uh, with everyone else. And Alex will drop a screenshot into the chat that you can use. And if you'd like to use share anything else during the campaign, you can feel free to um, tag at Bernardo's AU or include the hashtag um, 16 days of activism. And Alex will share those tags. You know, please feel free to tag me as well. I'd love to know what you're doing. It will be brilliant if we all decide to do one social post, media post per day, um, you know, about uh, uh, whether um, add something short and sweet, you know, and you could share the report, you could share you've been at the webinar, and you could share um, some of our great posts at Bernardo's TV advocacy platform, which we'll also share with you. And I, I got to say, um, our DV New South Wales, our peak body, has some fantastic 16 days social media uh, campaign. They've got some wonderful posts uh, on their social media that you could share, tackling different myths about um, the, the safe parent. And Professor Sue Hewitt Belt, who wrote that wonderful uh, reflective practice tool, she had a fantastic post on. Did someone just say women lie about domestic violence in court? Spoiler alert, they don't. <laughs> but if it's full of insights, you can post that. And if you're not on social media, um, you can tell a friend, a colleague or neighbour about the webinar and just keep sharing that with, you know, people that you meet, you know. So um, I think that's a good point to pause and um, ask if there's any questions that you want to pop into the Q&A. Okay, look, there, there's some fantastic questions there. So, um, yeah, I think, um, you know, what is the most important support for children following family violence is an absolutely wonderful question, kind of. And actually, um, that's actually why I'm embarking on a Churchill Fellowship. So my plan is to... Um, learn firsthand from best practice international experts about children's recovery programs uh, that have objective evidence that they work. Um, and I'll be leading change by bringing back the most suitable uh, programs and practices to implement nationally uh, so that children get world-class support when they need it. And I think the aim of that, which is important, is a much earlier and sharper focus for the system on helping children for, with them experience of violence. And um, that could include building our existing services by including new and revised components that are based on evidence. For, uh, so my church itinerary has a number of um, pertinent examples that are research-based and should work well in Australian context. And one of those is the KIDVA program in the UK, which actually includes um, uh, a social support program for children alongside all these uh, psychological ed educational activities and it's enormously appreciated by children who might feel isolated by their experiences and could easily be um, integrated with other programs so um, that's something I would love to return to to talk to you about um, uh, and, and run a webinar on that as well because it's a big topic in itself um, but I think also I think there's also some wonderful resources in that protective practice tool as well so, and in those two um, uh, podcasts from David as well. So, and that uh, that paper as well. So um, we could spend the whole, of, that's a fantastic question. We could spend the whole of our, our whole webinar on that. Oh, we got, yeah, okay. So. Um, We've got another good question here from, yeah? it's come up a couple of times. Um, it is 
from uh, someone called Denise, and it says there's supports for women, but what's the issue with providing supports for children? Is there a funding issue? Is there a gap in the funding to provide the vital to, to support to the children? Yeah, I think um, that's a fantastic question. Look, um, we know um, that children are silenced and invisible from this research. Um, adults didn't act on it and they were not believed. And so, um, you know, if we imagine if our progress, you want to imagine as railroad tracks, if you like, um, you know, we can see the railroad tracks ahead uh, and we need to end the cycle of harm to children. But, you know, implicit in this question, what would it take to accelerate that journey? You know, and I would say to that, we know that children's recovery programs are the critical response, the critical gap in our service system. We know that, you know, we all know that, you know, kind of. So um, if you want to accelerate our journey, uh, what we need is social investment in DV child specialist workers who can provide therapy and support to children. And if you really want to go the distance down those railway tracks, we also need more one-stop children's family centres, uh, like our organ centre, uh, to, that they could be based in so they're accessible to the community. Um, and there are other components to that as well. Um, affordable and accessible housing, giving the child a safe place to live is also fundamental to their healing journey. You know, and so um, that's some of the messages from uh, our research today. And there's another one here that it says that um, a Jenny has said, well, we have a dedicated children's team at our agency, but we, we find many agencies do not have staff who are trained to work therapeutically with children. And that's the gap that you're just talking about. Yes, that's exactly. And what, what a fantastic point. You know, what a fantastic point. So, so I think, um, I mean, part of that is about um, the implementation of practice frameworks that are truly child-centred. That's something we're doing here at Bernardo's. That's a work in progress. That's one part of it. Another part of it is um, a thoroughgoing implementation of the safe and together model or models like it, um, because uh, we really need to um, see children's behaviours and understand what they're telling us and their stories in context, <laughs> in the context of the harm from the perpetrator on their household, on their family, on their relationships. So that's another part of it. That's fantastic that you've got that service. And I, I agree and, and I completely understand uh, the, the issue that you're struggling with, with um, practitioners who are not trained in a way that um, allows them to really listen to children about their DV experiences. I've just dropped into the chat if anyone else has a specific question they would like answered to type it in. So at the moment there's not not any more. Thank you so much. Well look, um how about we do final thoughts? Because um you know our time has gone so fast and I my cup of tea is all gone. So and I'm sure you're feeling like another one. So um, we've actually done today a little bit differently. Uh, rather than being uh, table driven, we, you know, we've, uh, as researchers so often are, we really wanted to give you something more engaging for 16 days and to, to give you some resources that would be useful. And, you know, we're very aware, I'm aware with the time that we haven't covered everything, but please feel free to reach out. Um, if you feel like you'd like more content like this on, on this topic, you know, feel free to give us a thumbs up in the chat. And um, thank you so much for your time and have a great rest of the 16 days.